Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and we have like an incredibly in-demand steel player, first call session guy, and we're with Russ Paul, and he's also very unusual in that um, he's got a very interesting marketing technique for a lot of the things he's done, and and because of them, he's like very in demand for all of them. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Let me give you a little background on Russ. He started guitar at age nine. He started playing pedal steel at 15. He put in his first 10,000 hours playing clubs and ballrooms around Minnesota. At age 30, he moved to Nashville, touring with, check this out, Dickie Betts, Michael Johnson, and Don Williams. He was in a band called Great Plains that were signed to Columbia Records in the 90s. He put in his second 10,000 hours playing Sessions. He played steel guitar with Vince Gill for five years, and he's recorded with literally hundreds of artists, among them Miranda Lambert, Florida Georgia Line, Blake Shelton, Robert Plant and Allison Krauss, Johnny Cash, George Jones, Don Henley, Elton John, and he's currently playing guitar with Dan Auerbach's Easy Eye Sound Review, sponsored by Daddario Strings. Russ, thanks for your time. I really appreciate you oh, on the show. Good, good to be here. Good to be here. Thank you. So you started playing pedal steel at 15. Mm-hmm. And I, I've never done a survey, but I'd imagine most people don't start playing pedal steel at age 15. So I was curious what the backstory to that was. Well, I'd already been playing guitar, and you know, I was one of those kids who saw the Ed Sullivan show with the Beatles when I was nine, so I got the full impact of that. <clears throat> Plus, I was already uh, I, at that point. I was already playing some guitar, folk guitar, because my sisters were both into Peter, Paul, and Mary, and that. So I already knew the E and the A and the D chord. <laughs> and I then I saw the Beatles and Ed Sullivan, and it was like the the hook was sunk. I mean, I, there, it was, I knew from that moment exactly what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And, uh, so I was playing guitar the, the very next day I took my cheap silver tone acoustic, took it down to my dad's workshop and put knobs on it and made it an electric. I didn't know that you had to plug it in. I just knew that it had <laughs> knobs and stuff. So it was, I was, I was pretty entranced by that whole thing. So I just kept playing. And when I was 15, I was playing in a uh, country band and made a lot of money as a 15-year-old kid going around playing these places. And on um, on Sunday nights, we would play a ballroom about 70 miles west of Minneapolis. And every Sunday night, this ballroom owner had a connection where he had a Nashville band that was going through. Uh, I saw Tammy Wynette there, saw George Jones there, saw uh, Ernest Tubb. And and we would open. Our little band would open, you know, play during the breaks. And so one night we were there. There was a guy named uh, Wynn Stewart, who was a California guy. He was playing, and he had Ralph Mooney, the steel player, was just having a good time going out on the road with him. And he came up to me after our first set and said, kid, you're playing the wrong instrument. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're over there bending all those notes on that guitar and everything, and you're trying to sound like a steel guitar. Why don't you just play a steel guitar? And I said, well, I don't, show me. I don't know what you're talking about. So after that, after the show was over that night, uh, I hung around, and uh, he sat me down beside his uh, behind his famous old Fender 1000 with the half moon on it and showed me a couple real rudimentary licks. And the next day, the bass player, who was old enough to drive, we skipped out of class that afternoon and uh, heard of that there was a pawn shop in North Minneapolis that had a used pedal steel. So we went down and I bought it for probably 100 bucks. It was a homemade you know, pedal steel, but it was enough. And uh, by the next Friday, I was playing it on the gig, you know, real simple stuff. But I took to it pretty naturally. You know, the mechanics of it. My dad was a machinist, mm. so I got uh, the, the mechanical thing comes pretty natural. And so uh, so I've since then, I've been both a guitar player and a steel player. Wow. Isn't it amazing how I always find, you know, when I hear people's stories that like how the you know, I, I have the saying, you can't connect the dots moving forward. How, right, you know, right. Like the, the like the serendipity of this guy. Right. Seeing, you know, I mean, that's like. 
uh, that yeah. bo- I got like goosebumps. That boggles my yeah. mind. These, you know, the little intersections that people have that dramatically change their whole history. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You just, you know, it's just, you don't, you don't dare close your eye for a moment because something like that may pass you by and something that changes your whole life. Yeah. So So once you started playing it, did you feel uh, equally passionate about both or were you more drawn to the steel or? Well, you know, I think to be real honest, I'm a guitar player at heart because guitar is very comfortable to play. It's a very uh, tactile instrument. You can lay on the couch and play guitar. Steel guitar, you have to get up, you have to sit at it. It's a device. A guitar is more like this beautiful thing. So uh, as much time as I've spent behind a steel guitar, I still, I think I'm closer to regular guitar, but uh, the steel guitar is capable of so many cool things, so it keeps drawing me back. But, uh, you know. It's a physically demanding instrument, isn't it? Because you have to go to it. Right, right. And you you know, and you're connected by both feet, both knees, both hands. So uh yeah, it does take that and it you have to have that kind of wiring. You know, you're you have to be wired for that. I've seen some of the best world class guitar players in the world go, I wanna play steel and I go, I'll help you, I'll help you and they're miserable. They don't get it. It's just like there's something missing there. And then I have a daughter who when she was about seven sat down behind my steel one day and started playing it. And <laughs> and then she got up and walked away, thankfully. But <laughs> it, I think you're either wired for it or you're not. Mm. You know, and some people find that hard to, you know, to buy. But uh, I think, you know, it's just like some people are wired to pitch baseball. Yeah. You know? No, I believe you know, I think so. you're I think everybody has an inherent talent for yeah. some stuff or, or not, you know. Yeah. Do you ever see um I know he's not known for this, but I, I love David Gilmore's steel guitar playing. Oh, oh yeah. David Gilmore and uh, Jimmy Page. Yeah. And John. I, you see, uh, steel guitar is a very weird world. Um, in the steel guitar world, there's kind of these rules and regulations. It's like bluegrass where, you know, well, there's or you know, if Buddy or Buddy Emmons or Lloyd Green didn't do it, why would you bother doing it? And I'm one of those guys who I love all that. And I mean, I respect it. I've studied it hard, but I like, well, I like Jimmy Page. I mean, he was playing pedal steel on the, I think the first Zap album, you know, and, and playing it at a totally different way, but what a beautiful sound, you know, he actually did something no one else does. And David Gilmore the same way. And I use, I I have the David Gilmore uh, lick, which is uh, uh, a six minor to a two major, that big uh, slide. I use it every day, you know? So, it's wonderful, uh, man. There's a beauty, and and I think those rock guys got some of the best tones out of those guitars too, because they weren't they had no preconceived notions yeah. about it. Jerry Garcia. Uh, Jerry Garcia had been playing pedal steel for probably two weeks when he did Teach Your Children. <laughs> he, you know, to be honest, Teach Your Children is the prototype of all modern steel guitar. That's what everybody wants to hear. They don't want to hear all the fancy old, you know, beautiful playing. They want to hear that hippie steel. Yeah, it's true. You know? I'm just so, hearing that line in, in, you know, I've heard that song, I don't know, 500 times, a thousand right, times, probably right. throughout my whole life. And uh, as soon as you said it, that li- you know, the line immediately came to me. It's so funny how certain things. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's deep in our psyche now, yeah. you know? So, uh, so there's a lot, I, I, you know, I, I walk in a line with the, the steel guitar world, you know, where there's all this tradition and then there's all the, you know, throw caution to the wind. And I'm, I kind of, I, I like to embrace it all, you know? And I think it's a great tone generator. I think, uh, it's, it's it's sort of been underexplored sonically. So I've done a lot of stuff. I wire I, my, I wind my own pickups and everything. So I've made pedal steel pickups that are more like guitar pickups, and they work better with uh, effects devices, boxes and distortions and everything. And, and so I've started kind of rebuilding the instrument from the ground up to play it more like a guitar. Dude, I think the Paul Steele guitar is next in line, man. I have a vision. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I have a vision here, man. Pretty murky place. Make it happen. Um, it seems like like when I watch, I, I 
go back to Gilmore because I've I've spent a lot of time mm-hmm. with him. I've seen him play live. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately, not in person, but I've I've seen dozens and dozens of videos of him. Right. When you play steel versus when you play guitar, it seems like when you're doing those, you know, deep emotional soul, you know, long notes. Right. 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 It seems like doing them on a steel is more of a connection because of you know you're staring down at it is that correct or no or is it just depends well it on can the- be there well there's also a connection because you're operating uh there's basically uh you know my pedal steel only has two pedals some of them have like eight or ten pedals but that first pedal is the we call it the money pedal it's the one that uh takes the b string and raises it a whole tone. You get da, and that's where half the emotion is. So you got your bar and you're moving the bar, but then you got that pedal and you got a lot of control in that pedal. That pedal is fine tuned. So there's a lot of expression in that. So yeah, you know, uh, you can, uh, there's a lot of space between those notes. You know, mm. there's a lot of little, uh, uh increments <laughs> so yeah. there's a lot of feel there so yeah the potential there is is huge for a lot of feel but then listen to uh Derek trucks playing oh uh, yeah <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> yeah you know and he doesn't he, he doesn't seem to be lacking for the pedals but uh you know he's the, I, that's where i see the future of uh, some of pedal steel guitars you know uh, emulating what he's doing you know he's 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 almost closer to the human voice than a lot of steel players, you know. I think maybe some of that's that uh, sacred steel stuff where they're trying to emulate the vo- the human voice. Mm. I saw him uh, close. He was they come down here every year for the uh, St. Pete Blues Festival. I took my older son, I don't know, five six years back, and Derek closed out the show with an old Bob Dylan song called "Down in the Flood." Mm-hmm. Now, man, I've seen a hundred concerts at least. I had never, th- this was an experience, watching what he did, this one yeah. song, I couldn't talk after, I didn't yeah. even know what to say, it was like, like the supreme being in the universe had just orchestrated that thing, and I was like, right. holy shit, I told my son, I said, Nick, you're never going to see something like that in the rest <laughs> of your life, it was yeah. it was pretty crazy stuff. Well, I, I get it, you know, he's he's... He's got a connection, and you know he's one of those guys that comes along and redefines an instrument completely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you're doing sessions, you do st- mostly steel, mo- mo- guitar. Is it uh, split? It's split. It's split. Depends on who I'm working for. A lot of the uh, the what I call the 16th Avenue Nashville stuff, the the uh, you know the big pop records and all that stuff. I'm mostly playing steel, but. Uh, then I kind of work a lot for uh, uh, people like T Bone Burnett or, or uh, uh, Dan Auerbach. Do a lot of work for him, and I play more guitar. You know, and 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 uh, I, I like playing guitar because you can be involved with the rhythm section. You know, yeah. steel guitar is uh, not the most rhythmic uh, I- instrument. You know, I try my best, but you know. Still strumming on a guitar is one of the, you know, it's a very powerful tool. Tool. It's a drum kit. You know? Yeah. Well, it must be really nice for you then be, to be able to go back and forth. It must really make it not dull ever. Oh, yeah. No, I, you know, every day is a new adventure. And, you know, generally I'm always challenged. It's like, you know, everybody wants a little more than what I feel I can give them. So you got to, you know, you got to, uh, you got to deliver all the time. So, it's, it, it, yeah, it's always challenging. And I still get up every day and, uh, grab a guitar. I got a guitar by the bed, and that's the first thing I do in the morning is get up, and and it just feels good to the hands, you know. Mm. It's very comforting. Yeah, it is. It is very. Co- it's. It, you know what I like most about playing guitar? It's. It's. You have to be in the present. Yeah. You know. You. You got no. Tr- and if you're. If you're. In, you know. In, if you're connecting with it you have to be right, present right, you right. can't be worried yeah. about like some meeting next week or no some no. crap that happened last month it, you know to me it is a bit of a security blanket it's just something that feels familiar and uh and you know i'm i'm a guitar geek so i you know i get in there and file the frets and i set them up and everything and when there's nothing nicer than a guitar that's 
you know, firing on all eight cylinders and feeling really good. It's just, it's a very good feeling, you know, an electric guitar, even when it's not plugged in, it feels good. That vibration feels good on your body. Yeah. You make me very want- tactile thing. It is, it is tactile and it does feel great. Now you're making me want to go pick this up. Uh, <laughs> I would never do that in front of you. <laughs> what, what prompted you to move to Nashville and how'd you get your first gigs when you moved there? Um, I kind of, uh, hit a rut up in Minneapolis. I was playing clubs. Uh, I played, you know, all kinds of, I played in rock bands. I played in country bands. I played in polka bands, uh, disco bands, but I kind of, uh, felt like I was getting to be the big frog in a small pond. And it, it felt like I saw people around me that were really good sort of being complacent about what they do because they already kind of established themselves and you could kind of float along. And I thought I need to be challenged by this. And I thought I need to go somewhere and Nashville seemed, you know, the obvious place to go. And I I was right in that even to this day, I've been here for 30 years and I, every day I play with some of the top players in the world, but every day I got to bring that game. Mm -hmm. You know, I can never rest on any kind of laurels here because there's a 30 people behind me that are ready to jump in. And, um, I love that challenge. And so basically it was, I I needed, I needed the challenge because I just kind of got, I got in a rut. Um, how I first started playing here was, uh, I came down here and thought, well, I'll play pedal steel. So I came down and, uh, the first couple months, every night I would have my steel guitar in one hand, my amp in the other. And I'd go to all these little clubs and I'd go and say, Hey, can I sit in with you for a set? Can I sit in with you for a set? And they'd go, okay. You know, sometimes I'd set up on the dance floor, whatever. I'd play a set with them and then I'd go move on to the next club and I think it just bugged them enough where finally they go, well, we need somebody to substitute next week, this kind of thing. So actually, uh, it didn't take too long. My first gig uh, uh, in Nashville was with Dickie Betts. He was living in Nashville at the time, and he wanted kind of a countryish thing. So uh, through a friend, they said, you know, we know this guy who plays steel, and he's got a pretty open mind about rock and roll music. So I ended up playing with him for the better part of a year going out and touring and stuff. What was that like? Oh, it was great. You know, Dickie is, uh, he's a, I think mercurial Mm -hmm. in that, uh, when he was on, he's the best. I mean, at that thing, Mm -hmm. that tone, that, you know, he owns the thing. And then there was some nights he had been through treatment at the time. So he was very straight. He was not drinking or doing anything. The rest of us were, but, uh, (laughs) uh, but, uh, he uh, and then there'd be some nights he'd get frustrated and he'd take off his guitar and leave the stage, you know. But when he's like on, literally just say, "I'm yeah, done. yeah, I'm done. I can't do this," you know. He would get just you know. So, <laughs> but wow, that's I mean, ballsy. when that band was, uh, I have a friend who's got some board tapes of that band, and uh, that's you know one of the best bands that ever been in. You know, yeah, I would and he's got that sound. I mean, he had, he had that '57 gold top. Through a, I think he was using a 50 watt Marshall amp through four JBL 12 inch speakers, so there was no mistaking that sound. It was all over, and it was right in your face, you know. But it was, uh, you know, tone is a very interesting thing. Uh, tone, uh, tone is your voice. You know, there's different kinds of tones, but base, you know, a player acquires a tone over time. That is their voice that you can identify them. And he definitely had a voice. Yeah. You know, still does. You know, I interviewed uh, Jack Pearson. And actually, his his interview came out today. And Jack said that when he was with the Allman Brothers, Dickie usually played through not one, but 200 watt marshals oh yeah and you know that's why jack had to, had to wind up leaving his hearing was was just right, right. really really getting damaged but he said it was and dickie never went through the pa it was always yeah you know and he said it was just he had never heard anything that loud in his entire life which right. you know you think 200 watt amp, i mean that's i can't even imagine that well i gotta say one of the a moment in my life was, I must have been, I don't know what year it was. It was Jimi Hendrix's, 
I think first headlining tour. The first tour he did, he was opening for the Monkees, and they put a stop to that. That didn't work out. But he had, uh, you know, he had the the original experience, and it was at the Minneapolis Auditorium. I was probably in sixth or seventh grade, um, and there was an opening act, and then they closed the curtains, and then a few minutes later, all of a sudden came this sound, and I'm imagining it was probably 200 watt stacks with that Stratocaster dimed out and he just played just the most the most amazing sound i'd ever heard in my life there was no pa for it it was just coming out of those amps from behind the curtains it filled the room and it was one of the most amazing sounds that ever that's the first time i'd heard truly loud guitar in great hands it was you know and he was just warming up but you know it was it was incredible sound Wow. It changed my life there. That was one of those moments ago. There's a sound I've never heard before. That's, you know, that's the sound of heaven right there. <laughs> I like that. That's the sound of heaven right there. Um, okay. So you basically hustled when yeah. you got to Nashville and you yeah. worked for free until you, cause you said, Hey, I know I'll, if I work for free enough, I'll get yeah. known and somebody exactly. will say, Hey, you know what? I like what you did. I got I need this, right. which is exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. You seem yeah. like a hustler in general. Oh, I can be. Yeah. I can be. No, you I know? mean in a, in a very in a very good way. I mean that. You know. No, I <laughs> well, mean yeah, like you seem like one of these like you're very you seem to be an industrious guy that you know, you're open to uh taking a shot at stuff and, and yeah, trying yeah. it and then if it works, great. Yeah. No, I I'm ready to jump in and you know, at the job at hand. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I you know, I knew at the time I couldn't afford to be shy because uh, what's the use of coming here if I'm just going to sit around? So mm -hmm. I, I really did dig in and I was probably fairly aggressive, but you know, I was nice about it, but I ended up making a lot of good friends that way. And it did kind of get me into the, some of the circles, you yeah. know, as a player. Were you, were so, you sorry, I apologize. Oh no, go ahead. Were you shy before that? Like, did you, was it, did you have to sort of like come out of a shell well, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm one of those guys that if I don't, if I'm around people I don't know, I'm usually pretty quiet and shy. And then once I know them, you can't shut me up. But when I first came here, I didn't know anybody. So normally I would be kind of shy, but I realized that ain't going to work. I'm going to have to dig in. Yeah. So, you know, I did. I give so. you credit for that. What, 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 did you have any like a role model or like some sort of an example like that to look at and say, this is how I think I should do this. Or you just sort of winged it. I kind of winged it because, uh, well, part of it was, you know, I came to town and the first couple nights I came here, there was a, a place called the hall of fame Inn, and the first night, buddy Emmons was playing steel, you know, six night a week, a bar band. And then the next night, Paul Franklin was playing there, you know? So I've come down here and I go, I came here to play steel. You know, I, I, I'm not even in the same league with these guys. So part of me went, you need to come up with your own way of doing this. You need to get your own voice because those guys already own that. And, uh, if I try to emulate them, I'm, I'm always going to be a very second rate version of them. Hmm. So I realized very early on suddenly being in around the major league because in Minneapolis I was, you know, there was that major league wasn't there. Yeah. I came to Nashville and it was like, that's the state of the art of steel guitar right there. So I realized I need to figure out how I can do this on my terms. So I will be the best at what I do. Yeah. That's and it took a long time to do that. You know, for me, it took many years to, really get the right, the proper voice. I may, I made a few missteps along the way, but, yeah, but to know. have that, I think to have that sensibility of, okay, I need to figure out these guys are great. I know I'm not them. Let me figure out my <clears> own thing. I think that takes a lot of sensibility as opposed to, you know, I mean, option A is holy shit. I really don't even need to be here. Let me pack up my stuff. Right. Well, option B is let me do their thing. You know, but I think what I think that's pretty impressive that you said that it's it's like well, very industrious. It's just yeah, it's a survival instinct. You yeah, because I I knew I could go back to Minneapolis, but I would probably uh, become a hopeless alcoholic because I would have been bored. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, playing in clubs. You know, there's that's a bad combination. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So, uh, and this is where the major league was as far as music. I mean, this is where all the 
the infrastructure for the music businesses, all the booking, all the management, you know, the record labels, all of the working bands, the recording bands, everything was here. So mm -hmm. I knew everything I needed was here. I just had to kind of establish my own voice in it. Yeah. It's funny. I've, in, I've interviewed a number of uh, guitar players and whereas your experience was with Buddy Emmons and Paul Franklin on the steel, mm -hmm. they all have the same experience. And the story goes, I came to town and I saw Brent Mason <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I said to myself, I don't even know if I should be here. And it was their version of, you know, what you just said, but exactly. I, yeah. you know, like, yeah. you know, they did like Johnny Highland would go and watch him every night and bring a little cassette tape in his pocket yeah. and record him. And then, so he'd go home and learn his licks and just say, okay, right, well, he right. can do this. I could, do, you know, so everybody has their own, but it's a, a, a similar version of, of, Oh yeah. 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 You know, there's gotta be, I think a little bit of righteous indignation to make, you know, well, if he could do it, I could do it. You know, I think to make yeah. it work to, for anybody to be successful right. in some ways. Um, okay, so your first gig was with Dickie. How did you get into session work, and how did you stay in session work? Because you've had a very long career in doing sessions. I mean, it's you know, it's not well, it's not easy. Well, it's not so much anymore. It's to a lesser extent, but the there was a whole industry in this town and there still is to a lesser extent built around uh, uh demo recordings publishing demos so i i i observed early on that songwriters were the people i needed to get to know because they were the people who were going to end up doing demo sessions because i could go to de uh, to uh, session musicians all day long say, I want to get into this. And they're going to go, well, great, but I'm already doing it. Why would I want to help you? you yeah. Know? So I uh, started meeting songwriters. I started hunting down songwriters and some of them I would actually write with a bit, but for the most part, I just tried to go, Hey, you know, I'm around, I'll help you. If you want to go do, you know, let's work on some stuff here. So I sort of uh, got to know some songwriters and, and then you get to know the publishing companies and pretty soon uh, you're there starting to call you just because, you know, it's just like getting into the clubs. I just kind of bothered people enough until, uh, and then you have to, you know, you you also have to deliver something really cool, and you got to deliver something that is a little shinier and brighter than the guy next to you. Sure, sure. You know, so I was always trying to think, well, how can I do that? How can I, uh, uh, you know, can I do it with my gear? How do I do that? Sometimes it's how you dress. You know, you, it's just a whole way of carrying yourself in the session world. It's part of it is you're you're invited for three hours at a time to come to, into somebody's world and be part of their world. And you're serving that world. And a big part of it is you can't come and be grumpy. You got to come and be a positive force in that, you know, you can't come in and take over. You got to come in and, you know, check out the room and go, well, uh, somebody, so-and-so there seems to be in charge. So let's just go with what they're saying. Sometimes you walk in the room and you go, nobody's in charge here. I'll, let me, you know, let me lead this a little bit. It, sure. it, it, everything is different. So it's just, it was a matter of, uh, I call it reading the room. You just yeah. got to go into each situation. And here we would do that three times a day, all through the nineties. I played at 10 in the morning, two in the afternoon at six at night. And a lot of times it'd be three different places and three different complete groups of musicians mm. each day. So you just learn, uh, to, uh, you know, check out each situation and then apply yourself properly. And then you start learning song structure, being around the songwriters. And pretty soon you become a better arranger than any of them because you've been around 800 songs so far that month. Mm. And uh, I go with gut instincts. There's a lot of times I go, you know, that bridge is, is pretty good. But if you put two bars of a four chord at the end of it, I think it would have a nice resolve into your last chorus. You know, and sometimes they go, no, thanks, but no thanks. Or sometimes they go, oh, well, let's try that. And it might make you the hero, you know? It's just, I would, I'm surprised that some, that they would say no thanks in a, in a, in a situ. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this from a business standpoint. If yeah. I'm in a room with a, <laughs> I mean, it's like telling your roofer, if your roofer suggests, well, if we try this, we might fix the leak. And you say, oh, no, thanks. I mean, yeah. It didn't make any well, s sense to me. Well, but that's the difference. That's why you have to read the room because yeah. 
there's just going to be somebody there. There's some producers that they want to tell you every note to play. Okay. And some producers just get a group of people together. They go out and drink coffee and let you do the work, you know, and, and so it all depends, you know. But, yeah, there, it, it, it runs the full gamut. I've been around long enough now where when I'm at a session, uh, you know, it's like now I have a bit of a reputation. So people tend to listen a little more. But when you're new, hmm. when you're you're a new man on the block, uh, you got to once again, you got to check it out. But once in a while, you just got to go, hey, you know, this might be a good idea. And sometimes uh, maybe you shouldn't have said it. It, it just all depends. Mm. But, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, a lot of it's like high school. There's always, you know, little pecking orders in every room you go into, you know. Is, is reading the room easy for you or was it easy for you when you first started? And if so, why? It, it, it took some time. Oh. You know, I had to kind of learn and uh, now I'm probably better at it, but I'll still get surprised every now and then. Mm. But, but I think that that's a real important thing i suppose in any kind of business you know you just got to go in and you, you sort of see what's the pecking order here because there's generally going to be a pecking order especially if money is changing hands yeah, oh, somebody's yeah. somebody's going to be in charge hmm. you know and uh there's there's a lot of musicians that are uh i call them there's broadcasters and receivers there's some people that they talk all the time they play all the time but they don't listen and then there's some people that are they're the quietest ones in the room and they're listening. And, you know, those are the ones I tend to go, what do you think? Because, yeah. you know, they're actually listening. Some people aren't really listening. They're just putting out information. So it's, it's got to find a balance between those. It's interesting. Um, a, a few other guys have talked about the importance of this. Two that come to mind are um, Jeff King mm -hmm. and Jerry McPherson. Yeah. And, like you, these are two guys that are like, you know, first call, always busy. And I think that being aware of that is probably an ex a, a very strong reason why, you know, being able to right. negotiate a crowd of people right. three different, three times a day for 20 years, yeah. you, you know, you, you, you got an, you got some pretty sharp skills doing that. Well, you got to know when to crack a joke or when to not crack a joke. Mm -hmm. there, you you got to know when to – maybe it's time to break the ice or maybe it's time to, to just shut up and play, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an exact quote that someone else said. I, j I just needed to shut up and play. Yes. Um, talk about for each of these artists, Russ, if you could talk about – how you got the gig and the nature of the engagement. And maybe if you okay. have an interesting story about working with them. Okay. First one is Robert Plant and Alison Krauss. Uh, I had been, I have friends that have been in the, the T-Bone Burnett camp for a while and they were always going, you know, one of these days, you know, I've been telling T-Bone about you and, you know, and, uh, one of these days and, uh, one day I got a phone call going, um, Russ, it was like nine o'clock at night, man. We're over here with uh, Robert uh, Plant and Allison Krauss, and T Bone would like you to come over. So I mean, <laughs> I I packed up my steel and I went over to Sound Emporium. So I got over there by ten o'clock at night, and I walk into a full room of world class musicians. Only one of them I actually knew, the bass player Dennis. Other other than that, it was all new people to me. I had met Allison once before, but, and it was, uh, you know, go in, they're already working on the song. So it's sort of, I, things stop for me to carry my steel guitar and amp in, <laughs> set up. <laughs> well, I think and, you aren't self-conscious enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and anyhow, I get set up, I kind of get tuned, they get the microphone on it. And then this big, tall blonde guy comes out, T-Bone Burnett comes over him. It was nice to meet you. And then he looks at me and says, I don't like steel guitar licks. <laughs> he turned around and walked up to the control room and we started. Hey, recording. I'm really happy you're here. <laughs> yeah. But I, I knew exactly what he was talking about. I got it. You know, luckily I knew that that meant he doesn't like just what you would expect steel players to play a lot of licks. He expects you to play the song. And 
I've never, I've worked with him steadily since then. Oh, and wow. we've never had that discussion again. It was, it was an understood thing. And, uh, we've never discussed how to play since then. So whatever you, whatever he asked you to do, you did. Yeah. So he wanted, he, he wanted to steal in the background is what he was saying. Well, he wants you to honor the song, honor the song. Don't show that how good a steel player you are show what how good of a, a song guy you are you know and it's about uh yeah and it would be you know there's times to step out there's times to play solos but is it serving the song you know and i think he'd run into a lot of you know i think he just associated steel guitar with this kind of guys that play a lot of fancy licks and then they're basically plugging their licks into the music somewhere where it was more, no, he wants you to play the music. So anyhow, we, we, we reached a very good understanding. At the time when he said that to you, how many years of experience, how long have you been playing? A long time then? Oh, yeah, I'd probably been playing 30 years. Okay. No, I knew exactly what So that you weren't intimidated. You just understood. It, he, he wasn't intimidating. He was just explaining. Oh, no. Okay, so, yeah, okay, that's great. Yeah, you know, he was just kind of laying out, this is, what I, this is what I would like from you. Yeah. And luckily, I had enough experience to know exactly what he was saying. And like I say, we've never had the discussion since. I would actually rather have a guy that is so direct like that. Yeah. To be honest with you, because at least you know expectations and you can meet them. Yeah. You know, I hate, I much prefer that than like somebody who's passive aggressive and kind of like, you know, it's just a bet for me anyway. That's a much better way of communicating. I would have, I would have appreciated that a guy like uh, when he said that to you. And it, hey, it, it, like you said, you've been working with him for ages, so it worked. Yeah. Well, luckily I got it. You know, I could have been, I could have taken it wrong and I could have been intimidated by it, but it actually sort of, uh, reassured what I would have done anyhow, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, Elton John. Elton John, hardest working man I've ever worked with, or one of them. Uh, it, once again, it was with T Bone Burnett. Um, and basically, they had been working on a record with him and, and, and Leon Russell, and uh, they wanted Steel on a song, so. Uh, he set it up with a friend of mine, an engineer here in Nashville, and we did the overdub here in Nashville on our own and then sent it back, and they mm. put it on note for note for, on the record. And they put together a tour with a band that T-Bone put together and to go out and do uh, probably seven or eight dates uh, with Leon and, and Elton. So the first day at uh, rehearsals out in Los Angeles – I get there, and Elton's already there playing piano. I mean, he was the first guy at rehearsal. He would be the last one to leave. And he, rehearsing, he rehearsed as hard as anybody. I mean, he wasn't flying, he wasn't phoning it in at all. I was very impressed with that. And he was very, uh, uh, he was great to me. Uh, he, uh, you know, for the first couple of days, I was just kind of the guy where they're playing steel, but he would come over after that and go, I really like what you're playing. You know, I, you know, you, you, you're, I would like you to play more because you don't need to just play what would be on the record. He said, I like the way you are negotiating the, the, the chord changes in my songs that you're not, it doesn't sound like a steel guitar playing, playing licks. Once again, it was like, I was looking for pivot points, chord changes in the songs where the steel works really good, you know, especially those first two pedals when you're, you know, pivot back and forth between a one and a four chord. I usually hunt for places in a song where there's pivotal chord changes and it's just a very, it's a very expressive tool. So he got that and we got along fine. That's cool. Um, you know, I meant to ask you one question. The first time you saw Robert Plant, uh -huh. was it weird? No, because he uh, – see, the first time I did – the first session I told you about where I got called, he wasn't even there that night. It was just Allison. Okay. And then they called me in a couple days later, and it was just T-Bone and Robert and me doing some overdubs. And we ended up talking the whole time. And Robert has this encyclopedia, encyclopedic knowledge of blues records, and we were talking about the different colors of the blues records. And then we got into country records and stuff. Uh no, Robert was a great guy, very, very uh, talkative, very a big music fan. Hmm. 
You know, he's just, he was, was curious. He was curious about the pedal steel. You know, he wanted me to kind of show him how it worked and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, no, he was very, he was very engaging. Yeah. I can't, I, I, I can't imagine what it's like to have put out a body of work like he has. I mean, it's, yeah. I, I, that has, you know, it's one thing to have a hit album. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but I mean, he's got 15, 20 of them. Oh, yeah. It's almost statistically impossible for that to happen. You know? Well, it's just wild. He's another guy that uh, I, I, I've kind of come up with the saying that, you know, in Nashville, you're only lucky for six months. Uh, <laughs> but basically, everybody I've ever met that has had any kind of sustained luck. I found he's a workaholic. Yeah. Usually they don't sleep a lot, and usually they're the ones that are uh, – they're not even fashionably late. They're usually early, annoyingly yeah. early. Mm. You know, they, 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 they wake up at 5 in the morning, and they're already thinking about what needs to be done. And uh, that's just what I found. Dan Auerbach is a workaholic. I mean, the guy – he's texting me at 5.30 in the morning with guitar pictures mm. and stuff. You know, it's just – uh, I would think rock and roll stars, you know, kind of live this great life and they sleep in and they got people doing everything for them. I, I found just the opposite. Everybody I know that's had any sustained success is uh, a complete workaholic and they're geeks about it. I, I think it's like that in any business, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody that I know that that is you have to be a, you can't casually be good. No, you, no have you have to, to be hands on. Yeah, you you have to be like intense and very deliberate about stuff. And, yeah, you know, um, and you can't be afraid to work. It's mm. like you don't, you know. It there's no, you cannot be lazy. No laziness, you never get anywhere. God no. Yeah. Talk about your experience with Dan. How'd you get the gig? And and any cool uh, stories? Well, Dan, uh, he lived across the street from Buddy Miller who's a guy I work with a lot. Um, and uh, one day Buddy called me and said, there's a guy who lives across the street from me. <laughs> it's Dan Arbach, and uh, he he's looking for a steel player, and you're the guy. You know, He needs you. Is it okay if I give him your number? I said, yeah. So Dan called me himself and said, uh, man, can you come over this afternoon? I'm working on something. I'd like you to come play some steel. So I go over there, and he's working on a record with a guy named Bombino, who's a Tarig tribesman from somewhere in East Africa. And uh, there was, the whole room was full of these guys dressed in head scarves and everything. And, and uh, I walked in and, and he said, just go do what you do. So <laughs> I sat and I ended up spending the next three days with them playing this music that was, uh, you know, they, none of them spoke English. They spoke French. Their manager was with them and that was their common language. And, uh, we did that record and, uh, I actually went uh, and, and right away I knew Dan Arbach was a, a, some guy I wanted to hang with. He, we, I just right away recognized there's something there. And so I gave him the pitch that I've never given anybody else, but I, I pulled him aside and said, Dan, I really like you. Uh, I'm here as a steel player. But I'm a guitar player, and I would like to play guitar for you. And I said, that's pretty presumptuous of me because you're a world-class guitar player. But I said, I have, I think I have stuff that you would be interested in as a guitar player. And I, please don't just limit it to steel. And we've been working ever since. That's awesome, you know, we, man. You know, and we've become – well, we're fellow guitar geeks. Yeah. We're always sending pictures, you know, the guitar pornography, you know, yeah. look at this guitar, look at that guitar. And, and, uh, we, uh, play a lot together and, uh, I play some steel and stuff, but we're touring. I don't even bring a steel guitar, but you know, steel guitar. I, uh, I get stand up right next to him and we face off. We've, worked out all kinds of dual leads and we uh, feed off each other. I think he, I think he enjoys having a foil. He'd been in a band so long with one other guy yeah. that played drums that I think he really enjoys having a guitar foil That's great, and, man. and I really enjoy it. So, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's That's a lot of fantastic. Fun. You know, I think that, that I applaud you for doing that. And I, 
it would seem most musicians would not do that because I think a lot of musicians I talk to, they're very awkward when it comes time to use the word pitching. But like, yeah. I, I think most of the, and I don't know why, because, you know, I think, I, you know, you, you, there's a difference between, you know, like bragging or, mm-hmm. and, you know, just being a jerk than just saying, hey, what you said, I've got something to offer you and I think you'd, I'd like to try it. And, you know, what is it like? Like what? Why would someone say no to that when it comes well, down to it? And if you know, they do, what's this, the downside? Right. There's all just the fear of rejection. But this yeah. is probably a lot like going to those clubs early on. I think I felt I uh, once again. I'm you know if I don't really know somebody, I'm usually pretty quiet and sort of observing. But once in a while, I think you need to speak up too. So and, and that it worked it worked that time, you know, and, and Dan has become a, a great friend and we, he's, uh, I mean, he's has boundless energy and we're, I'm as soon as I get done with this, I'm going to go the other day. I said, uh, I play slow banjo. Did you know that? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, 20 years ago I was playing banjo on every record in Nashville and and I'm not a banjo player, but I know how to play a slow roll, and I can play with a click track. Mm. And I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to play something really simple and dumb. So I told him that a couple of weeks ago, and now I keep a banjo over there. And he called me last night and said, "Can you come over? It'll take 15 minutes. I want to put a slow rolling banjo on this song." You Very know, cool. so it's just little things like that. You know, so uh, it's so much of being a session player is not about being a master of an instrument. It's about uh, being more of a master of song structure Mm. and what to put in there and go, this song could use a propelling force, something, you know, maybe that rhythmic banjo would be good or maybe a chink guitar or something, you know, just different things. And uh, you just have to be able to, uh, or I do anyhow, every once in a while I'll just go, you know, I think you could use this, the, the record's missing an element here. So uh, let's try putting in a, a tremolo guitar hmm. or let's put a high strung acoustic in, you know, it's just, it's a palette of sound and, and records are all, it, records are, are like a painting. There's, hmm. there's shading, there's dark lines, there's places where there's a haze, all of that stuff. And uh, learning the, the shape of a record is really important and then being able to voice that. And sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes it does. Sure. Of course, off topic, do you exercise or something? You have an unusual high energy level. Uh, I get up and walk every morning. You yeah, know, that's it. Man, five yeah. minutes. High energy. I figured you exercise. Your energy level is so <laughs> high, man, which is great. I love that. Um, you grew up in, you said, Minneapolis? Yeah. What was just, your ch- west, just west of Minneapolis, kind of suburbs. You know. So. What was your childhood like? Um, great. Great. Uh, we... Lived in the suburbs, then we moved to a, a little 80-acre farm when I was about 11. And so I got to, you know, I, I, uh, fifth and sixth grade, I went to a one-room country school, and I milked a cow every morning. I had a full – and we we had one winter in Minnesota with no plumbing in the house. We moved into this old house, mm-hmm. and – uh, the next spring, my dad and I put in plumbing, but I lived a winter. <laughs> my poor sisters and mother, you know. Oh but we we God. we had an outhouse in the in you know Minnesota, so Holy so I had you know a real kind of a uh, suburban rural upbringing. Uh, when I was about uh, twelve or thirteen, my parents split up, and so my mom decided she wanted to get away, so she moved to San Francisco, a suburb of San Francisco in 1969. So I went and I went out there in 69, I was 15 and uh, went to finished high school out there. So I was got to go to the Fillmore West, go to Winterland was Berkeley. I mean, it was just, (laughs) so I went from this rural rural Minnesota experience playing with country bands and, and polka bands. Then I was out on the West coast for three years and got the full immersion you know, California, you know, and being a hippie kid. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. So I had a great childhood. Yeah, man. That's pretty, that's awesome actually that you got to and do I, that. I had a lot of, uh, my mom was busy. She was working her way through college. She was cooking in restaurants and then going to classes. And she said, 
if you keep at least a B average in school, I'll, I'll know that you're keeping it between the lines. So I'm you you. I, I did what I wanted to do in high school. I mean, I was and I was out playing in bands, playing in horrible bars when I was 15. You know, so we'd have to go wait outside during the breaks because you weren't supposed to be in there. But if yeah. you were on stage, it was OK. And I managed to not get in trouble. So uh, I had a lot of great experiences that not now with my own kids, I, I thought, boy, I, you know, I would have never <laughs> let them do that. But my mom was very trusting, you know. And uh, she had, you know, she knew that if I was at least keeping my grades up, I was at least behaving. Yeah. So. Did you have brothers, and, brothers and sisters? Two older sisters. Okay. And uh, one of them is a uh, a writer. She writes kind of like I play guitar. You know, she writes for hire. And the other ones are retired. She worked for the state of Minnesota for many years. They're, we all get along good. They're really smart. I'm the wild one. <laughs> And uh, what, what kind of work did your dad do? He was a tool and die maker. He's a machinist. So that's where I get that. Yeah. And uh, he also uh, grew up on a farm, and he really – he was a serious hobby farmer. So uh, we had 80 acres. He was working at Minneapolis Honeywell as a tool maker, but still he was farming 80 acres too. He had a lot of energy. Oh, my God. That's like not a casual thing to farm 80 no, acres, no, man. Right. Holy crap. What kind of, what was it, a working farm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, uh, like I said, when I was in the sixth grade, uh, we had a milk cow. You know, it was like a hobby farm. It was, he was, he did a lot of, uh, uh, custom where he had uh, a real fancy hay baler and a combine. And so he'd go around doing combining and hay baling for other farmers mm. and stuff. And he, he'd have me out there driving tractors, which I love to do. I love, I didn't like loading hay bales, but I love to drive a tractor. You know? so, so that's where you got this hustle from your dad. basically. Yeah. 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 Okay. I get that. Okay. It makes sense now. Very cool. So that's a really like uh diverse. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's really good because you probably learned so much from two, like almost, diametrically opposite right, right you know you got the conservative midwest thing and now yeah. you're out in san francisco and berkeley oh, God. Oh, that was breaking holy loose. shit yeah. in 69 yeah but and all the while i had a guitar you know i was playing guitar or my pedal steel i you know i was always the kid at school who was looking out searching out other musicians and uh uh watching you know i was i was way into uh, rock and roll, but I was also way into Merle Haggard and Buck Owens and hillbilly music. So it was, there was a lot of information and, uh, I was pretty geeky way back then, you know, doing a lot of studying of that stuff. So. Yeah. But that's why you're in, able to do what you did yeah. now for so long because of all that. Yeah. It's just, it was, it was a training ground. And I was always, I, you know, I, like I said, since I was nine, I've been doing that. I didn't mm -hmm. even talk about doing it. I've been doing it since yeah. I was nine. So it's been nonstop. Well, that's wonderful, man. Um, you mentioned that you had made some mistakes earlier. Uh, you know, everybody pays tuition as far yeah. as making yeah. mistakes. I was wondering if maybe you'd be so kind as to share one or two things that you – mistakes you made and what the lessons were that you learned. Well, I think really – it was the mistake would be just uh, staying with a comfortable situation too long. And that's what I did. I kind of have a three year limit now to most anything I do. It's, it's just after three years, it's kind of time to move on because you can get complacent. And that would, I, I would say when I was in Minneapolis, I should have dug a little deeper and got out of, you know, I had some situations where I was making enough money to, to get by and I really wasn't uh, progressing musically. You know, I was just kind of, uh, uh, just, uh, having a lot of fun and playing in bars at night. But for a couple of years there, I, 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 I did hit a rut that would, be, you know, so I don't, I, you know, I, I don't think I ever made any horribly tragic mistakes, but I think there was a few years there that I probably wasted. Yeah, I think everybody could look back on their life though, and yeah, yeah. I mean, how many mistakes? You know, yeah. as far as wasting time, you know, right? It's too, you know, tuition. Like you don't know. It seems like yeah, you got to learn somehow. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you could go back, well, me, no, me, I said afterwards. Uh, the flip side of that question are there is there anything that you did 
that you think at the time was out of your comfort zone, but turned out to be a good thing? Hmm. Oh, once in a while, I've been just in a band where I was beyond my abilities, you know, to play a certain style of music or something. And uh, what I, at least my way of approaching it is, I would, uh, I found that I could actually end up being comfortable in the situation, not by doing what was expected of me in that genre of music, but just applying what I do to that kind of music. I, I don't know. That probably sounds a bit confusing. No, it sounds uh, like you, instead of worrying about what you thought you were supposed to do, you just did the best you could with the tools you had. You, you, right, right. you know, you were Russ Paul. Yeah. And, and not work. Yeah. And you did the best Russ Paul could do. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that's just kind of my modern approach to everything. Anyhow, yeah. you know, just try to give it my best shot at what I do and, and, and don't try to do what somebody else does because for the most part, I all have all their phone numbers and <laughs> it's easier to call them and get them to do it. You know, <laughs> that's funny. You know, I interviewed, uh, Reggie Young and he, and I'm sure it's a story that you've heard. Uh, he was on a session one time early in his career when he had just come to Nashville from Muscle Shoals or from Atlanta. And he said, uh, Reggie, do a little Grady Martin on there. And Reggie turned around and said, Hey, he lives in Nashville. Yes. Like get him in here, you know? And he said, everybody right. was laughing. You know, he's a very uh, humble, you know, he said, I didn't really mean to be a smart aleck. I just meant like, you know, <laughs> get, you, can, you can get great in here. I don't need to be, you know, like, and he said, everybody was cracking up, but I, I, I think that's the same thing you're talking about, man. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Uh, it's, and I, I kind of, you know, and once again, I, you know, I, you get to a certain point, I'm 64 years old. I've been here a long time. I'm relatively established. So th there's a point where you just go, hey, I don't mind sharing. You know, it used to be, well, I, I had to have, you know, uh, you know, I, I wanted to have it all contained. Now I realize, man, there's a lot of other people. It's okay to share this. Yeah. And I don't have to be the only guy. Yeah. And, and actually, I take a lot of pleasure in uh, being able to – People call me to do something that I either am not interested in doing or I don't have time or something. And it, it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to share that with other people and just go pass that on, you know. So I like that. And I feel like I'm at a point in my life where I'm comfortable doing that, you know. Maybe there would have been a time where I was more competitive. I don't feel as competitive anymore. So. When 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 you get to that point, doesn't it – like because – I'm just the different person I know now. I'm, I'm 10 years younger than you, but like around 50, I got to the point where I'm like, I I kind of realized that I'm responsible for X amount of the stress in my life. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have to do that. Any, that oh, yeah. This is optional. <laughs> and I'm opting out now, you know? Well, I found that there was a, 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 at 50, you had that. And then at 60, you have phase two of that. Okay. And you just you just realize so much stuff that you sweated over, all the bullshit yeah. just doesn't even matter. You take on new stuff, you know. You start taking on that, you know, all your friends are getting sick and they're getting old and all that business. But there's just a lot of stuff that I just don't even care about anymore. It's funny. I laugh about it, you yeah. know. And, and I try to tell my young friends, you don't need to worry so much about it. But that's wired into people. So, you know, there's yeah. only so much you can do about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But life should be pleasant. Life really ought to be. <laughs> yeah, that's you know I saw this. Uh, I saw a documentary on the making of Dark Side of the Moon, and Roger Waters said something in there, and he said, you know, most people are born, and we are all like preparing to do this when that happens. Mm -hmm. And he said he someone taught him or he learned that that's not a smart thing to do because you, it's not like you're preparing for what it's not like right. this is a, a dry run you know you right, it, right. it's like it starts man don't prepare just get it done and i thought that was yeah. really good advice and and i was and i have been guilty of that in the past myself so i was uh ready to hear that message when i when i watched that about 10 years ago okay let's talk about gear for a little bit uh you told me about that beautiful 58 Mm -hmm. 335 you have i don't know anything about pedal steel uh -huh. so if we could 
talk about more on on the electric guitar and what is your go to guitar right now and maybe what other two would round out your top three? For this is pedal steel you're talking about? Or no, no, no. For a regular electric guitar. Oh. I, I don't know anything about I couldn't talk to you. You know, I steel. actually I've been you know, i I've been putting together guitars for a few years now. I I buy there's a company called MJT. They uh, sell Strat and Tele bodies and stuff on on eBay, and he finishes them. He like relic finishes. I buy bodies from him. I buy these necks from a place called Music Craft with a K yeah, out of New Jersey, and I lacquer them myself. And then I buy parts, and then I make up the pickups. So I'm kind of, uh, you know, I build guitars for other people, and then with the proceeds from that, I build my kind of. Uh, uh, experimental guitars so i'm my main guitars now is a couple they're strat bodies uh with only two pickups because i that third pickup always confused me even as a kid it's just uh, i like a two pickup guitar and uh and i'm experimenting like i have once uh i've got uh well they're just uh single coil pickups that, that i've wound uh, one has a mahogany neck instead of a maple neck with a rosewood fingerboard, which is kind of my main guitar right now. It's a red strat looking thing. Uh, and I've got a version of that with humbuckers in it. And, uh, I've got a, uh, I've got a couple Gretches, the, the late model Japanese Gretches, you know, one with the Filtertrons, the other with the, the Dynasonics. Um, I like those a lot. I've got a, uh, uh, 335 that uh, uh, what's the guy uh, Rich Robinson it yeah. looks kind of like the one behind yeah. me there it's uh, I got it from Rob McNelly and I put in some uh, Tom Holmes humbuckers and it really holds up it's a fine fine 335 I mean I like I said I've got a 58 335 which is kind of a benchmark guitar and the that uh, Rich Robinson really holds up well that's kind of you know and i'm not i'm not afraid to take that out and play it you know where the the old 335 you kind of have to you know you got to be careful with it but you know, what kind of, just what's tom holmes pickups i never heard of them what, what made you put uh, he's a guy that? he's a guy that's been around nashville uh he lives out in joelton tennessee and he was making guitars and pickups when i first came to town in the mid 80s and he makes some humbuckers now i think they're He's having somebody in Japan make them to his specifications. But uh, if you can find his humbuckers from about 10, 20 years ago, they're bringing a lot of money and they're really good sounding humbuckers. You know, they just, uh, uh, you know, to me, a good Gibson with a humbucker has this beautiful, sweet high end. You know, sometimes. Uh, humbuckers can be a little dark sounding and a really good, really good, well-balanced humbucker uh, can sound like a fender. If you need, there's, there will be that sweet high end, but then that little bit of growl in the low end. So uh, the Tom Holmes pickups are good. I've got some, I think they're called OX eight ox fours. Yeah. Ox fours. Yeah. Good. Yeah. They're out, of, a, out of England. Yeah. I've got a set of those. The you know, PAFs. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I've also got some uh, uh, throwback. It's a company up in Michigan, I think. But I've actually got some kits that when I get the time and the energy, I want to try wine. And I, I've wound some uh, Firebird humbuckers, <laughs> which have sounded pretty good. Uh, but I haven't done any full-size humbuckers. That's kind of my next project is to make a set and see how I – shape up compared to the old PAFs. We'll see. <laughs> I may, I might be laying in the dirt there, but, uh, uh, you know, and I've got, I've got an old guild Thunderbird. I like to play. I've, I've got a number of guitars, you know, and, and I, uh, have some nice acoustics. I've got a couple of arch tops that I like to use a lot for playing rhythm in the studio. I've got an old J 50 Gibson, uh, you know, I've got a choral sitar, you know, the sitar. usual, yeah, yeah, I've got, uh, uh, old Dan Electro six string bass that I bought at a garage sale for 25 bucks <laughs> years ago. And, uh, so I got, you know, a collection of all that. Stuff. Sure. Um, you have to be pretty meticulous to wine pickups. I would imagine. No, that's a slow thing. Yeah. It just, it takes patience. It, and you've, 
I, you know, I probably wound uh, 200 pickups to get 40 good ones. You know, I, it, wow. it took a while. I'm getting, yeah. I'm getting better at it. And I recently bought a milling machine. So now I can start making my own bobbins. So now I'm experimenting with doing like, I've, I've always thought of Stratocaster. The bridge pickup is always kind of a weak link in a Stratocaster. So I'm working on a, a bigger footprint, uh, single coil pickup to go in the bridge that, uh, when you go from the neck, which always sounds great on a strat, when you go to the bridge, you don't feel like something's missing. You know, go to one, you know, when you're in an airport and there's those, those walkways, you know, yeah. that are, and you're they, walking they along, move, they move, they move yeah. and you're cruising along and then you get to the end and you know how you feel. Like it's just kind of like everything kind of slows down. <laughs> Sometimes that's how it feels when I go from a neck pickup to a bridge pickup on a Stratocaster. It's just like, eh, this is disappointing. So one of my goals in life is to make a pickup for a Strat in the bridge that still sounds and behaves like a strap pickup, but when you kick it in, it's like you're ready to tear into it, you know. And I'm getting closer. It's 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 a that's one of my projects. Kind of like a bridge pickup on on a on a, a Les Paul. Yeah, or yeah. a Telecaster. Even you know, a Telecaster bridge pickup is a is a one of yeah, the yeah. best things ever. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But the neck pickup on a Telecaster can be kind of iffy. Yeah. You know. So I, I'm, I'm playing around with the chemistry of that stuff, you know, just mostly for my own curiosity. Sure. You know? And I just want to tell the listeners that like three or four very top end session players have told me how good Russ's guitars and pickups are, but you cannot buy them. <laughs> so well kind of what i'm doing i tried custom making a couple of guitars for people and i just i don't like doing that because they get this you know they have all these expectations and i just feel like uh I, I don't want that pressure so kind of what i do now is i build a guitar for myself and then it sort of filters out to somebody else you know so there's a guy named Guthrie Trapp who's a good friend of mine and he's got one of my other guitars and the other day I uh actually a couple months ago I uh sort of gave him my favorite Telecaster and he hasn't given it back so I guess I need to <laughs> Is that the green one? That's not yours. No, it? no, that's 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 a, it's an older one. There's a gold one he's got and now there's a Sunburst that he's been playing a lot and uh and I kind of Wish I had it back, but it's in such good hands that it's fine, you know. It's well, you I'm know, interviewing it's him tomorrow, so if you want to, oh, okay. Talk, talk, Russ, hey, Russ wants his Telecaster well, back. <laughs> it, 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 it's very gratifying for me to hear really world class players oh, playing he's... on my guitars and just go, "Wow, I'm you know I'm inside that guitar." Yeah. Especially yeah. the pickup winding, you know. I feel like you know I'm 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 really pretty heavily involved with that, hmm. so. It, it's satisfying. I make my own steel pickups, and uh, I have a friend, uh, a guy named Jeff Surratt, who lives just outside of Nashville here, and he builds Show Pro is the name of the company. And he was actually an apprentice to a guy named Dwayne Mars, who was one of the major guys at the old Showbud company. So it, there's a direct lineage from the old Showbud company in his guitars. And Jeff's built me about five guitars, and every time we do it, we get further out. I've, I've been experimenting with a longer scale length, just different construction of the body. I have a guitar now that uh, is truly badass, and it's very modern. It, it does all the modern trickery that I would like to, to do. But at the same time, on a dime, I can turn left and play straight country with it, and I don't feel that it's uh, lacking in anything. You know, And it's something I... I've wanted to have my whole life is, is a steel guitar that could play country and rock and roll mm. all, you know, seamlessly. I so. can see why you wouldn't want to build guitars for other people. Cause I could see the joy and the fun in this. And then when you have expectations, it's sort of like, it puts pressure on you because then you want to deliver. You don't want to d do something that's half assed right. and, right. and it's right. like, it takes the fun out of it. I totally get that, man. My kind of my 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 sales thing is uh, if there's somebody that I think I would like playing one of my guitars, I just kind of put it in their hands, don't say anything, and see what happens when they call back, you know. And uh, uh, so far, most everybody's put the money down, and and I've never given a my uh, my father-in-law is the only guy I've ever given 
Billy Sanford is the only guy there. He's he's taken a couple. He's uh, uh, Accosted several of my guitars. <laughs> no, I he's, al- he, he's allowed though. He's the only one who gets the freebies. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Hey, talk about music. Um, what would be like your top three desert island discs in no particular order, oh. and just for today, knowing that you know okay. you, you could change tomorrow to whatever well, you want. You know, let, let's just. It, it is known that I'm probably the biggest Jeff Beck fan in the world. I think he's probably one of the finest people to ever play an electric guitar yeah, uh, he uh he scared me about 10 years ago i was uh, at one of the vince or uh, eric clapton's crossroads festivals playing with vince gill and jeff beck was there and i saw him do the sound check and then saw him play the gig just you know standing on the side of the stage at the end of the gig i called my wife and said i think i'm going to sell my stuff and i <laughs> I, I could not play for about three days. It 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 did it I shook it. me, and then I was in three days later. I was very inspired. But Jeff Beck, I think, has more control over the guitar. He he came out there and casually did things that I could only dream of wanting to mm-hmm. do. So anything by you know anything Jeff Beck does is great. I love Blow by Blow. Oh. I think it's one of my favorite records. The Jeff's Guitar Shop's great. I've uh, been listening a lot to Jimmy Page lately. Been reading all kinds of uh, Led Zepp uh, biographies and stuff, and I think he's one of the great architecture uh, architects of, of records. You know, guitar, just the things he does. Uh, you know, I'm a big Merle Haggard fan. I love what uh, Roy Nichols did, Norm Hamlet, uh, the, the Strangers Band, uh, of course. You know anything by the Beatles? I was that was that's just genetic. That's um, I listen a lot to uh, Aaron Copeland, the composer. Composer, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's just very peaceful music. Has nothing to do with guitar, so it, 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 I really like that. Uh, I listen to surprisingly little pedal steel. I, uh, I mean, I have my favorites, but I don't go out of my way to listen to it a whole lot. I, I don't know if I'm even that big a fan of it. There's some really great stuff I love, but uh, it kind of frustrates me. So I don't listen to that much. And I probably don't listen to that much guitar playing. Hmm. You know, I, 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 I like to listen mostly for the music, you know. But, you know, there's such great guitar players. There's a guy named Julian Lodge that uh, – uh, my son-in-law Tom turned me on to. We've gone to see him a couple times, and uh, my my wife was asking, "Well, what, is he good?" And I said, "Yeah." She says, "How good is he?" And I said, "You know that one song you like by Chet Atkins, the one that I wish I could play?" And she says, "Yeah." I says, "He's that good." <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that guy's name mentioned before. Oh, he's he's. Uh, he plays – I'm not a jazz fan. I don't get jazz really and he leans towards jazz that actually is accessible to me somehow. So well, That's what Beck did. Yeah. Beck did yeah. the same thing. You oh, know, yeah. it's, it's – I, int- I feel the same way you do about Beck. It's, it's – it's I don't it's I don't understand how he does what he does. I right. interviewed two of his guitar players. I interviewed Jennifer Batten uh-huh. who's a world-class guitarist herself. Right. Oh, yeah. And I interviewed um, – Carmen Vandenberg, who was on his last album, uh-huh. and I asked them both, you know, what did you learn? How does Jeff do what he does? And they both basically said the same thing. I have no idea. Yeah. And they both, especially Jennifer, you know, she's she's stu- with him for three years, and she studied him night after night after night, mm-hmm. and she said it's just, you know, first of all, he never puts down the instrument. He's at it, not surprisingly, yeah. you know, 24-7. And um, I agree with you. Yeah, he's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, I have, uh, I have a real close friend, a guy named Lloyd Green, who's one of the great masters of the steel guitar. And we play a lot. I don't play steel with him. I play guitar with him. And we, we do a lot, produce some records with him and stuff. He does stuff. I've, I've known him for 15 years now, and I've never – once asked him to show me how to do anything. I have no idea how he does anything, and I kind of don't want to know because I I do think that there's a point where it it there's some magical stuff that goes on, and I don't even want to know the nuts and bolts of that. 
You know, and I just yeah. want to know that there's, there's magic there. And uh, I, I've got to say, my uh, my father-in-law, Billy Sanford, uh, is one of the best guitar players I've ever witnessed. He, if you talked to him, you'd never even know he was a player, and then you would never know he was a successful player. But uh, when he just casually on a session or something, some of the stuff he pulls out, it's just I don't know where that came from. Uh, I don't know how he got that sound. It's 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 it's, it's a direct link from the soul to the finger or the soul to the speaker of the amp, you know, and all this other stuff is just, just a process. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I totally get it, man. You know, so I, I really believe that there's a lot of some kind of magic in, in the really great players. You know, I've talked with Lloyd green so many hours about tone. Where does tone come from? And I really think, True tone, like I mentioned earlier, that voice that we would all love to have uh, is something that uh, you hear in your head and you spend your life trying to make an instrument make that sound that you hear in your head. You know, and it's so it's just uh, some people just have this great vision and somehow they manage to actuate it. And you look at the guys who are known for their tone, right? Like, um, Guys like Paul Kossoff, Dickie Betts, mm-hmm. right, uh, right. you know, even I don't know if you know Greg Martin from the Kentucky Headhunters. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Great tone. All they do is plug a cable into an amp. They're not. Yeah. There's not like effects going on. No, no, no. Uh, you know, I mean, and even Beck. Yeah, sure, he's got some like when he's getting you know some of the overt effects, but yeah. it's just no, him it's and a marshal, man. Yeah, it, it's in the hands, and but I think it's beyond in the hands. It's it starts somewhere else, and the hands are just a tool. It's just like the cord, you know. It's got it's some you know, but I I, I just I, I I take great comfort in knowing that there's just some stuff that we can't explain, and I don't even know if I'd want to know. <laughs> it's totally just get it. it's just, and it's great that we have recording, so we can carry this stuff around and listen to it, you know. And that's what it's all about, man, feeling good, yeah. listening to music yeah. and then making it feel good. I mean, it, do you really right. need to know? I don't really know. Well, you know, I, I, I'm a forensic, you know, scientist when it comes to listening to records. That's a lot of what Dan and Ar- Arbach and I do is we listen to so much music. When we're out on the road, he and I stay up the, late on the bus and we'll sit up, smoke a little weed. And and he has a iPhone that must have 8 million songs in it and <laughs> he knows where every song is and he's uh, he's a true musicologist and he'll play music and we'll study and we'll talk about well, what did they do to get that sound and then we take that in the studio and we try to you know use some of the those techniques and things but it's it's forensics you're digging in yeah. and most great records were there was a certain amount of craft involved in making those records upon on top of playing really good, it's just there's a certain amount of craft in putting. You know, it's like I say, Jimmy Page was a great. That's architect. what I was thinking of exactly when you yeah. were saying that. Yeah, you know, making these records and putting all these guitar parts, and it's like a little orchestra. Oh yeah, you know, and so I'm deep into that, you know, and that's uh, part of why I guess I, you know, am invited to play on sessions because I take the time to dig and go. Well, this needs a little part here in this kind of range. It doesn't need to have any low end. It should have a little sparkle on the top, maybe a little bit of a wobble, and then a little haze around it. You know, so there you're trying to put it into words, but then you you figure out a way to get that sound, and you put that in there, and suddenly there it fits in that record, and it's 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 like fitting a shelf in a kitchen. You know, you just need to go. Well, there's a need there. We need to do this, but it needs to do this. You know. But having that creativity and the knowledge base, you know, you've got mm -hmm. the arrows, all the arrows in your quiver so that you can pull them out. You know, there's years of years of doing that, you know, and it's a it's a benefit to to have that man in a situation where you're making a record. It's uh, pretty cool. And it's and, and and so much of it is not about using all your arrows. It's just uh, finding the right one. Yeah, the, the correctly placed arrow. Yeah, which yes, is much exactly. more valuable than just throwing ten of them out there. That right, right, right. Maybe they work. Maybe they don't. Randomly hit. Yeah, mm-hmm. I totally get that, man. Um, Russ, what's 
throughout this whole journey, musical journey, what is something that you've learned about yourself? Mm. Well, I've learned that, uh, I don't know. I'm just very curious. I, I, uh, I'm always picking up magazines. I'm always, uh, looking, I, I'm one of those guys who sees some little gadget and I'm the guy down there sticking my nose into it, trying to figure out well, what makes that work. And, uh, I never recognized that earlier in my life. I must've been doing that, but I really do like to, uh, snoop in to see what, what makes something work, you know? And it's funny. I just said, uh, there's some parts I don't want, you know, I want to be magic and I don't even want to know about that, but everything else, you know, I'm, I'm digging in. If, mm-hmm. if there's uh, something that I can take the top off and look inside and see why that thing spins faster than that, I'm the guy who's going to do that. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I'm really curious. Um, I realize I have a real soft spot for beautiful music you know music can uh, i mean i like really hard rock music i like really hard country music but i guess that's why i listen to people like aaron copeland and stuff because it's some of it is so beautiful and so delicate and uh i like a fact that a you know a grizzly old fart like me can still be moved by something so beautiful mm. you know do you remember when uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer did some of Copeland's stuff? I don't know if you remember. Oh yeah, that. yeah, was, yeah. That was really cool stuff. Back oh. then. you never hear stuff like that, man. I mean, it, that was such. I remember the first time I put that stuff on. I was like, wow. Well, if, if you listen to, uh, well, just listen to like the Appalachian Suite, which is a ballet. Uh, if you listen to that, and then go to any movie in of the last sixty years or eighty years, you realize that Copeland sort of is what movie music is. Yes. He, he, to me, he kind of invented what modern movie music is. And, and, uh, I don't know, my wife and I've sort of got in it together. We've always got that playing. The other day I was with Lloyd Green, the steel player, and we, I needed to chill him out. We had a big show that night. He was all <laughs> nervous. And I put Copeland on. He's going, what's that? And I said, Aaron Copeland. He said, that is so soothing. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, that's, I'm going to have to write that down too. Man. Yeah. Check, check more of him out. Yeah. There's beautiful Are you and stuff. your wife musically compatible? Yeah. She, uh, you know, she grew up in a musical household. Her dad was a you know world-class guitar player. Yeah. Uh, except that sometimes I get a little loud. She's very comforted when I'm noodling on a guitar in the other room. She said, that's what I grew up with. Daddy did that all the time. You know, right. he'd be noodling. Um, yeah, she's turned me in. She turned me on to the American Songbook. I was not interested in anything by uh, 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 Irving Berlin or any old standards. I just didn't have time. And she sort of got me in that direction. And now I can't get enough of it. What great songwriting! And it makes song rock and roll look so primitive, <laughs> you know. Which you know, which I love all the more for it. But. Uh, and then we've, you know, I've got her into some steel players, and she's she's a bigger steel fan than I am, <laughs> to be honest. You know, I, I, you know, once again, I'm not a big steel fan. It's mm-hmm. weird. No, I I can understand that because it's, I, I kind of understand your sense of, uh, that there's everybody has their own way of doing it, and you almost don't want to know as long as you've got your thing and you're right, comfortable right. with that. I totally 100% get that. I write ad copy, and very yeah. funny enough, um, I feel the same way when it comes to writing copy. There's a lot of certain principles people use, and I'm like, you know what? Good for them. I'm really happy. I don't right, really know right. because I like what I do. I like how I do it. I don't find it manipulative. I don't want to. I don't want to open a box of things that I that may damage the what I've really worked hard to. You know, so I really do understand what you're saying there. Yeah, it totally yeah. Gets. So, um, tell me something about yourself. People would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I don't know if I can answer that. So. <laughs> uh, I'd have to think too hard. I, I always say on these, I need to get the wife 
Yeah. Because, well, yeah. Yeah. I, I know if you pulled my wife here, she'd give you a rundown of probably 20 oh, things that she yes, thinks yeah. are odd about me. Um, and, and by the way, I want to tell everybody congratulations to Russ. He's been with his wife 27 years. That's um, yes. more of an accomplishment than you being uh, successful in Nashville for almost 40. That's, that's well, hard work. We're, and we're, we've, you know, it's, uh, it's been sometimes it's been uh, a challenge, but we've come out is. the better for it. We've yeah. come out much the better for it. So. Yeah, of course it is. You can't be. Yeah. it's a uh, tough man being in a relationship for that long. I hear you totally. Yeah. Uh, what's your strongest personal quality, or did you answer that before with your curiosity? You feel? I think curiosity, and then I've I've I don't know if I always had it, but I've learned that uh, to keep going until something's finished. There's uh, I, I think that is something that I've. Uh, sort of developed over time, but I used to kind of give up on things. And now once I get going, unless I just see that it's going absolutely nowhere, mm. I will try to at least see it through to the next notch. Yeah. You know? Well, you come across like that. I'm surprised that you even used to, yeah, uh, yeah you seem extremely perseverant. Uh, favorite and least favorite part of your job? Hmm. And I know you have many hats because you got session and you got touring. Well, I don't know. I love the puzzle of uh, taking a song, uh, you know, right from the the work tape where somebody's just written the song and there's no there's no no frosting on it at all. It's just the melody and the words and a couple chords. And I love trying to see that picture and see how that evolves. That's probably my favorite thing. Uh, the least favorite is hearing the work tape of the song, which is the words and the guitar chords, and uh, realizing that that is not a song and <laughs> still having to do the same thing to it. Uh, you know, I've learned I, I maybe in a way I'm a bit of a snob, no. but I did so many in the 90s. I did so many publishing demo songs that I really learned song structure and I, I like to think for the most part, I know when a song is a song and, uh, and then there's a, a collection of chord changes and words strung together that aren't a song that don't move me. And sometimes it's really hard to try to make something out of that. You know, that's a, not an uncommon answer for session guys. You know what? Jerry had the best title. He called it song triage. Yes. yes and, he, and he said, when you get a song and it has no business being in there right. and it's dead on the stretcher and no amount of those heart paddles are going to, he goes, but right. you got to basically make chicken salad out of chicken shit. Those are my words, not his, but yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, no, that's it. That's yeah. exactly it. So, you know, that, that, that is the, the hardest part. Yeah. That's, that's a, a number of session guys have said that, uh, if you can go back in time and do one thing differently, either personally or in your business world, what would that one thing be, if anything? I would have learned to read music uh, like I re- read words because it makes my job a lot harder. Uh, if somebody sings me a little melody that they want in a certain part, I have to learn it and memorize it where – I wish I could just like some of my friends do. They just jot it down on the paper. They don't even learn it. They just jot it down on the paper. When the time comes, they play it. Yeah, I get you. Another, not an uncommon answer. Yeah. Toughest decision you ever had to make or hardest thing you ever had to do? Mm. Hmm. Well, I think related to this would I, I, I realize that you have to realize in this business you can't be in two places at one time there's always times where you've got somebody wants you to do this somebody else wants you to do that and you have to make a decision and the toughest part is you got to make the decision and it, it helps me that I can go I can't be in two places at one time so I've got to choose one or the other but it's sometimes it's really hard for me to make that choice. And I don't know if that answers your question or not. That was, no, I may does. have dodged your question. It, it you was know. a dodge, but it was a fair dodge. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I always think this, this is an unfair question because life is so difficult. And like, I always think, God, if someone asked me that question, I couldn't give them the real answer to that well, because it would so uh, 
it impacts other people more so yeah. than me. And I, I could never, you know, that's a tough I don't, question. I don't, I don't live with a lot of regret. Mm. Yeah. You don't, so. I don't, you don't come across as a guy who like would have a lot of regrets. I think you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're one of these, you seem like one of these guys where, you know, you have been curious about stuff and you've checked it out. Yeah. You know, and, and you seem like really open to doing stuff and you know, like what the hell, why not? Yeah. You know, like you said, you're supposed to be here to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, last question, man. And I can't thank you enough for your time and your, oh, um, candor. You're, it's my pleasure. What's been the biggest change in your personality, Russ, over the last 10 years and how much of this change has been deliberate and how much is just a natural part of aging? Well, I think it's more than 10 years, but I've become, uh, there was a time many years ago, uh, in fact, I was, uh, recently got together with some, some old bandmates from the seventies and I realized I wasn't a very nice guy then. I wasn't, uh, very concerned about what other people thought or felt. And I feel that I've become more compassionate towards the people I'm working with, especially artistic people. And uh, a lot of times I would just not say anything rather than say anything good or bad. Now I try to say something good to people because I know that when people say good things to me, it helps me and it doesn't hurt to say that. Yeah. You know, and I think that's where I've probably changed. I, I don't know if I'm a nicer guy, but I'm more demonstrative about my f- positive feelings to other people. Interesting. Did your has has your wife noticed that? I think she's, you know, we've been around for 27, 28 years. I think most of it may have come around that time. That might she might have been part of the mellowing agent. Good. But you know, she. I think she. Uh, yeah, it's probably had a lot, you know, t- to do with me just realizing that. Uh, it wasn't that I was ever said nasty things about people, but I just didn't say anything. Sure, sure. And now I try to go out of my way to say something positive, you know, whenever I can, because I, I find that it it it, it helps. It, uh, you know, I don't say hollow things. Yeah, but just I, for, I think yeah. it really, even if it just improves a situation or makes a person's day, it's a lot hell of a lot easier to just say something nice and uh supportive than just give them that sly grin you know yeah so i I totally get that so i think she's probably being she's been a mellowing agent for me good for you 27 years of mellowing good for you yes (laughs) (laughs) hey man uh i wish that i could promote something of yours uh where when is dan on tour is his website is is, is his, does yeah. he have a website? Is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go like to Dan Arbach tours and, and, uh, we're going out. I think we're out to like the 6th of April or something. And, and I don't know. We haven't got anything booked out. I think he just wants to go back in the studio and make records. We've got about three or four albums booked coming up this summer. That's wonderful. You know, just doing different things. And, uh, he's writing a lot. I, I've really kind of, committed myself to his camp this year. I, I took him aside uh, last fall and said, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to keep you guys as busy as I can. I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here with you. I, I really like what you're doing. I like your energy and we're making really good records. So there, in, in, there's not a stinker. Yesterday we did a theme song for the uh, squid Billy uh, cartoon, you know, just really off the cuff stuff, you know? So good. it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, check out Russ. If you get a chance to see Dan Auerbach, it's a U E R B A C H. Um, go see Dan on tour and you'll see Russ playing and jamming with Dan and, uh, doing his thing, which he's been real successful at doing for a long time, man. I can't thank you enough. If you ever have something that you want to promote, would you come on the show? If you, okay. if, you if you go live with anything, if you, if Russ changes his, anti-marketing marketing techniques he'll come on this show here we're going to be the first person to have him okay you will be the first yes, you're we'll, going to be we'll get the you'll first be the spearhead okay we'll get the uh, first right of refusal to uh pitch russ and his stuff so man thank you very much you're a real sweet guy i really oh, got, I got to, to meet you i really admire uh a lot of the things that you've you've done man and, and i think you've worked really hard to get where you're at so i appreciate that thank you man listen uh 
Thanks, everybody, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Russ Powell as much as I did. If you want to somehow find Russ online, good luck. It's R U S S P A H L. <laughs> and then let me know, by the way, if you find something good. Uh, thanks again to Russ for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. He's a super busy guy. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified of future episodes along with some early product announcements and discounts. And remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have some fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.